So a pilonidal cyst is something that you don't like having, you don't want it to get worse, and you don't really want to think about, but it's really important to get this taken care of because it can become a recurring, ongoing problem. By the time I'm seeing patients with pilonidal cysts, they've probably already been to an emergency room once, maybe twice. They've had some sort of procedure or antibiotics. It makes it so you can't sit very comfortably, therefore it disrupts work, disrupts getting around. It's unpredictable and it's likely to come back unless it's dealt with definitively uh, from a surgery standpoint. Now, a pilonidal cyst um, generally occurs in people with a bit of a bubble butt that have a, a deep cleavage back there in their rear end that allows things to accumulate in an abnormal way. So if you've got a cleavage point up and down the middle of your hind end, every time you sit down and stand up, that cleavage point is moving like this. And you have pressure in your belly, on your buttocks when it's flat. When you stand up, there's less pressure. It acts as a billows. And it's potentially sucking things in if there's a hole there. And people with a pilonidal cyst develop a pilonidal pore right in the middle. It's usually a, a sweat gland. Uh, or a hair follicle that gets stretched out when they're sitting flat and then gets bigger and bigger and consequently allows things to start accumulating underneath there. And what goes in is generally hair, bits of lint, sweat, um, and it gets bigger and bigger with time. And as it gets bigger, sometimes it's noticeable but not causing much pain, but gets real noticeable if you're doing a sit up or sit for a long period of, period of time. Um, and eventually it gets infected. And it, what comes out of it looks like what you clear out of a drain in your plumbing with all kinds of hair and stuff. And some people have a series of holes back there. Other people just have one. Uh, people who have a really hairy buttocks have a higher chance of developing pilonidal cysts. People who have a deeper cleavage back there in their rear end have a bigger chance of developing a pilonidal cyst. So a couple of things happen. If your pilonidal cyst is become infected, it will be painful, it'll be bigger than before, frequently associated with redness around it. If that's the case, the first thing that needs to happen is that that cyst needs to be drained of the infection within it to let the infection clear. And the second phase is to deal with the cleavage point, get rid of the pore, get rid of the cyst, and rearrange things there so it doesn't recur. Uh, and that's a, a bigger surgery in the operating room. Frequently, these abscesses get drained in the emergency room if they make a teeny tiny hole in it it will reaccumulate quickly. If they make a bigger hole, you'll have a better chance of success. If they actually cut out some skin, you'll have a, long, a much better chance of success. Uh, but if they cut to the side, it'll heal relatively quickly in a month or so. If they cut directly across the middle, that middle will pull apart and it won't heal. It won't heal for months. So how it's addressed by, by the first person who uh, inter interfaces with the abscess really does define how long it's going to take for it to heal, whether it's likely to heal, and what we have to deal with uh, later on as a surgeon. But frequently, we'll see people that have had an inadequate drainage in the emergency room. Their cyst has come back. It's now been a month later or six months later, and they're chronically draining. It doesn't hurt real badly. Uh, but it is building pressure and predictably pushing pus out, kind of like Old Faithful. It just reaccumulates and drains and reaccumulates and drains. Sometimes it hurts, sometimes it doesn't, but it's not getting better. And for those patients, we need to do a, a drainage in the operating room with some sedation or a general anesthetic to open up the hole there, pull out the hair, pull out the junk that's in there, and let that fully drain and let it heal. And that process will generally take uh, uh, a month to two months. 
And once the patient is free of infection and things are softened up back there, that's the ideal time to do a definitive operation for pyelonidal disease. So with a definitive operation, uh, there'll be a pore, there'll generally be an old scar associated with it, there might be a new cyst developing there. And with the definitive operation, what we want to get rid of is the cleavage point, that, make it so that it's less deep than that, get rid of the pores that have enlarged, and get rid of everything that's scarred and diseased from the prior operation. So generally, I'll make a uh, diamond-shaped scar, taking out all of that tissue all the way down to the bone underneath. And once that's out, then we'll make an incision to the side like this. This will all be gone and we'll rotate this skin from one side across the middle so that point A ends up over here, point B ends up over here, and things are crinkled up differently than they were and you no longer have that deep cleavage point you no longer have the pore, you no longer have all that scarring, and instead you end up with a scar across the rear end, kind of like this, with a lot of stitches in it, and that's called a rhomboid flap. This operation you want to do when there's no infection there that's evident, uh, when you're healthy, and when you have a timeline in which you can recover it. This is generally a general anesthetic operation with you laying on your belly. You'll generally be at Meridian Surgery Center for about four hours. Um, sometimes you'll have a drain associated with it after surgery. Chances of uh, uh, bleeding and stuff are quite low. Uh, but the big problem with, is the recovery phase. You want to have this operation when you can uh, recover adequately. And by recovering on your rear end, we usually don't want you sitting on it for three weeks. If you've got a long commute, that means you're not working. If you work at your computer, that means you're standing to work at your computer. On your way home, we want you laying it down across the back of the seat in the car with the seat belt on, but we don't want you sitting on your rear end. We don't want you sitting on your rear end other than going to the bathroom for a period of three weeks. So you get the couch, and you're lounging across the couch, but all the pressure that goes on there causes the blood supply problems at all these corners. It pulls the stitches apart more and leads to wound infections and breakdown of the incision. And the last thing you want is a broken down incision on your rear end where you can't take care of it very well. So the big problem with a definitive pilonidal operation is taking the tension and the pressure off of your rear end for about three weeks after surgery. Um, at that point, we begin taking the stitches out back there, um, and we start sitting, uh, but not scooting. That is, scooting across and putting uh, a sheer force on there. But sitting down gently and getting up, that's fine. I had a guy that had this operation He's a 28-year-old young man, healthy, active, and uh, six weeks after his operation, he went skateboarding, and he landed flat on his butt, and he tore the whole thing open. And we had to, to deal with a big open wound back there. Uh, but that was just too early for that kind of trauma to occur to this location. So uh, most healing is done 80% uh, at about two months. Uh, but if you're going to do that kind of thing, this is going to, you really need three months or more of healing to be able to, to withstand that. So for patients with pyelonidal disease, frequently it's a two-phase process. One, they get the abscess drained and cleaned up. And the second, uh, find a timeline when they're infection-free to get a definitive operation and allow themselves the three weeks of not sitting in order to get over that initial phase of the operation. Uh, that is the, the big challenge, is timing and figuring out uh, when that's going to work for you. But this operation is 95% successful long-term in preventing recurrence of the pyelonidal disease process. It changes the contour of your rear end. 
um, and uh, uh, keeps these, uh, these more, more pores from developing back there. So if you're uh, in for pilonidal disease, think about it from a two-phase standpoint. Think about your life. Think about how it fits in with your life um, and uh, start taking action uh, when you can control the process instead of waiting for another abscess to develop. Okay, now I've got a really unpopular subject and that is complications after surgery. All surgeries have potential complications. Some surgeries have different complications from others, but there are some that need to be watched out with every operation. One of those are things that people naturally are afraid of and that's bleeding. Uh, for most operations, the risk of bleeding is relatively low, amounts to bruising, and rarely results in transfusion. If you have religious objections to uh, blood products, be sure and let your uh, a surgeon know about that. But rarely do we need to proceed on with any bleeding trans transfusion sort of issues in general surgery and the stuff that I'm, I'm generally doing. But there are a few things that can increase your risk of bleeding that you need to be, be aware of. Aspirin increases bleeding, it increases bruising substantially, and unless your doctor feels like you need to be on aspirin despite the fact that you're having surgery, most patients will be taken off of aspirin. Uh, likewise, ibuprofen, Aleve, any of the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories also have the same effect on clotting. So we'll generally have people off of those medications for a few days before surgery. External bleeding is very obvious. If you've got a spot of blood this big on your dressing, it's probably gonna stop on its own. If your dressing, however, is soaked and looks like it's continuing, you need to notify your surgeon right away. Frequently, that will get better just by applying pressure. But if it doesn't, it will need to be addressed during a, a close time frame. there. Don't be polite to your surgeon. I like that if you are, but don't wait till morning if you've been bleeding all night. That can be a, a real problem. And uh, uh, let the surgeon know if you're soaking your dressings. The other way that you know you have bleeding uh, is something you might not think of up front. For most operations, we want you up and around the house the night of surgery. And walking is good, it prevents blood clots, it keeps you mobile, uh, but it also gives us an early warning sign. If you're attempting to walk the night of surgery and you're pale and you're passing out, that's either a heart problem or that's internal bleeding. That's an automatic trip to the emergency room and Nobody should talk you into going to bed because you're dehydrated, you just need to rest. If you're pale and passing out or just passing out, period, when you try and walk, that's internal bleeding and needs to be evaluated that night. Call 911, call me on the way. Infections are also a, 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 a risk with surgery and anytime the intestines are cut across, there's a higher risk of infection. Um, Wound infections are not common at Meridian Surgery Center. The risk is about 1%. If your um, wound is red and angry, if it's draining pussy stuff, if you're having a fever over 101, those infections uh, symptoms are generally going to occur in the first week to three weeks after surgery. Uh, it's a nuisance. It might scare you, but it's probably not an emergency that requires an emergency room visit. And if you go to the emergency room, you're gonna be there 10 hours, um, call on the surgeon, texting a picture is the better way to do it, way faster, way cheaper, and will save you a lot of trouble. I had a patient two years ago who was pacing in the emergency room with this problem. He'd been there four and a half hours, he was getting really mad, other people were going ahead of him, he wasn't getting any attention, and he just went, <sighs> I'm supposed to be calling Dr. Wright. What am I doing here? Um, and we had it all, all figured out for him within 15 minutes. So um, be aware, the emergency room isn't generally the place for that kind of a problem. Let's get it taken care of. Anesthesia-wise, uh, your operation generally involves anesthesia. Local anesthetic has very minimal risks. 
but if you're allergic to lidocaine or bupivacaine in the dental office, we need to know that because that's what we're generally using, something related to that. Uh, general anesthetic and sedation procedures have uh, risk of anesthesia as well. Uh, we're generally evaluating that in the clinic as we go along with the surgery evaluation, and patients with high risk are generally done in the hospital setting. Patients with intermediate risks and low risk are in this outpatient setting. But that's part of why we're doing blood tests and EKGs in evaluation before surgery. And sometimes you'll be set up for an outpatient surgery and those tests will either cancel the surgery and require a cardiac evaluation or change the setting of the surgery uh, or tell us something else needs to be done before the operation is done. But we deal with, uh, uh, in the outpatient setting, minimizing the anesthetic risk and getting you through the operation as smooth as possible. You'll be speaking with the anesthesia provider specifically about your situation the day of surgery before you go in for surgery. If you have sleep apnea at baseline, we do ask you to bring in your CPAP mask because that can be helpful in the recovery phase when you're not breathing so well and when you're not, not as awake, uh, sort of like it helps you at night. Medications that we give after surgery can have reactions too, particularly if you've never seen them before. If you've had problems with certain pain pills before, we need to know that up front uh, so that we don't get you into the same trouble that you had before. But generally, narcotic pain medications are constipating. And the number one distress call I get uh, is usually four days after surgery, somebody hasn't thought about how their bowels are working, they've had their surgery, they're doing okay, but now they can't poop. And it can be the most miserable part of your operation if you're bloated after an abdominal surgery and you can't poop and you can't, you have to push it out and nobody wants to give you an enema. Um, so you need to be proactive on that. So the night of surgery, drink plenty of liquids. When you're starting to eat, don't jump into meat and potatoes. Instead, fruit and vegetables. You want lots of fiber in your diet that will help you with your bowels in that immediate post-operative period. And if you're a constipated person in the first place, clean out before surgery, take laxatives, and keep your bowels working. You would rather have the trots in two days than bricks in four. But certainly keep an eye on it. If you normally have really good bowels, you don't even have to think about it, be thinking about it. If you haven't had a bowel movement in two days, you need to take a laxative and get things going and make sure that you don't get bound up. That's the best way to have a smooth operation after the operation. So when it comes to complications, nobody can tell you all the possible complications. There are a number of things that can go wrong. Your uh, informed consent forms will give you uh, uh, a lot of answers there. Uh, but generally speaking, the more experienced your surgeon is, the less complications you're gonna have because they've seen things before and that experience helps them keep their patients uh, safe. Uh, so at Meridian Surgery Center, uh, you'll see a lot of experienced surgeons and providers uh, at your bedside uh, guiding you through your operation to minimize your potential for infection.